Thanks very much, Bob. And uh, you know, I'll say right away, Bob Blackshaw is a liar about some things. <laughs> Just about that. Anyways, thanks very much. So uh, I guess first off, I'd like to uh, thank you guys for sticking around and inviting me out here. I really, it's uh, I really like going, getting out and uh, to farmer conferences and talking to them about their problems and uh, and their and their uh, solutions more than anything. I know I was talking to a former student last night, an agronomist, and uh, very, I was very. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to say proud because I was very, I was very happy at the high level he was operating at, and and, uh, and it was a really, a really good experience. So anyway, so I'm going to talk about controlling weeds with agronomy. You know, we're in kind of a situation we've been around for quite a while with herbicides. You know, why are they still a problem? You know, here's like looks like kind of a, a steampunk sprayer of some kind I found on the internet. Uh, uh, you know, why do we still have problems with weeds? Why am I still you know why why am I here talking about weeds? You know, we've had herbicides for decades. We've had Roundup ready for you know it's hard to you know I'm you know I'm a middle aged guy so it, you know it's you know, I remember when it came in you know but it's been over 20 years you know it's been like 22 years we've had Roundup ready soybeans you know that you know when they came out it was like kind of we thought that might be the end of weeds and you know, so we've kind of come to expect really clean fields like this. Uh, however, you know, and you probably guess I'm gonna talk about this, about herbicide resistance. You know, that, you know, we've seen that increase in herbicide resistance um, that's uh, going on there, even in Canada, there's globally that one, now in Canada. And of course, something that we, that many of us in the weed science community thought might not even happen. I remember when people used to speculate, do you think there'll ever be glyphosate resistance? You know, but well, it's, you know, it started and it's come on heavily, uh, and of course we know that here, and part of the reason is, is that we have a, we have a bit of a problem with glyphosate. We, we really, really, really rely on glyphosate a lot, and the reason we rely on it is because it's essentially our operating system for no-till. You know, um, it, things have gotten better in the last few years. The message has got out. I think a lot of farmers are using our, our tank mixing products with their glyphosate burn off to not just rely on glyphosate, which is good. But uh, the key thing we have to remember is that, you know, um, that for, to maintain that system that was pioneered like by farmers like Ike, uh, who has uh, received that award earlier, that really it relies on glyphosate. It's, it's the operating system. We can't, there's no other product that's out there. And in fact, you know, some of my colleagues in weed science refer to glyphosate as a, a one in a hundred year product. So let's not lose it. That's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to say like, you know, let's, get rid of it, but let's not lose it because it's done so much good. And to do that, we might have to change our way of thinking. You know, when farmers like Ike first started doing no-till, that wasn't viewed as being the kind of, hey, I don't think everybody said, hey, that's a good idea. The people that were no-tilling were weirdos. They were, well, I'm glad not here, but they were, at some level, they were viewed as being outsiders to the conventional agriculture community because they weren't doing the thing everybody else was doing, summer, fall, and wheat. They were doing things differently. And I teach students, and I'm always challenging them to think critically, think critically about agriculture and crop production where it is now. Don't be complacent with how it is. Let's build a better future. My wish is that in 30 years from now that we are all, uh, that they, that I tell them that my wish is that in 30 years, they laugh at what I taught them that it was so backwards, that there was something, that there's better things being developed. And that's what I hope I can be a little bit of a part of. So conclusion, so my conclusion from this is anything you can you rely on too much will eventually let you down. Uh, and I'm, you know, I, you sit back and think about that for a second. There's a little bit of a nihilist comment at the end of a day like this. And uh, this doesn't reflect, this doesn't reflect my view of my relationship with my wife or anything, but, uh, <laughs> But, uh, but uh, you know, if you do rely on something too much, and of course, you know, you guys have probably seen this slide before from Bob Blackshaw, you know, of the glyphosate-resistant kochia that we have that in Western Canada now that uh, was first, uh, first appeared in Southern Alberta. So, so we have to look for, uh, for other, other things. So I think... What I am always a big proponent is using agronomy. And I used to call it, you know, sometimes people call it integrated weed management or something like that, but I think it's better just to call it agronomy. Just because what I'm talking about in many, in some cases, are just tweaks to what, how you manage your farm already. I'm not talking about, you know, starting to wear Birkenstocks and getting a tattoo and, you know, and doing yoga and eating tofu or anything like that. I'm just talking about changing how you manage your farm. 
And uh, this is the first experiment I'll show you. And this one here, you look at it and you think, you see wheat growing and it, that's wild mustard in different plots there. And you think, well, what can this be? Well, here's one treatment there, it's almost all wild mustard. Here it's, you know, it's still quite a bit of wild mustard. Here you're getting pretty good control. It must be a herbicide trial or something like that. No, this is just changing the wheat seeding rate. This is done under organic conditions. Full disclosure, I do I do, do work in uh, research in organic agriculture, but I do research in, ag in conventional agriculture too. So, uh, um, so here, and so here's the kind of the difference between using double the recommended seeding rate of uh, wheat and half the recommended seeding rate. And that's just the difference in crop competition of having the plant take up space. You know, in many cases, crop competition can be as effective as herbicides in managing weeds. And I, I dare say most of you in this field, if you're farmers, have unintentionally done this experiment on your, feed, on your farm where you've had a, a, a miss with your cedar and yet you've come back and done all the normal weed controls on it, and yet still there's weed escapes and you get through there at the end of the year and it's full of weeds, yet where you have a herbicide, you know, yet where you have a herbicide uh, sprayer miss, in some cases the weeds aren't that bad. Your crop was competitive enough to suppress those weeds. In many cases, and I'll give you evidence of this in a little while, essentially uh, herbicides are the final step in controlling your weeds. We're doing a, they're just the final step that, that, that kills an already suppressed weed population that's been weakened by competition and through good farm management. So anyway, so, uh, so uh, to start this, I'll go, I'm gonna go back to uh, wheat, looking at weed control and lentil. And this is gonna be an organic project, so, but I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna talk about conventional stuff in a little while too, so. But anyway, so I'll, <coughs> all this started, this was quite a few years ago, and I was in Saskatchewan and, uh, Roundup Ready canola had been introduced and everybody's talking about the end of weeds and everything, so I thought I better, I better try to get some job security. So I thought, thought I'll do some work in organic agriculture because I'll never control all the weeds in that. And, uh, so, um, and so I was approached by the provincial government and they wanted to do some work on organic pulses and organic lentil. And they asked me if I would do some work on weed control and organic lentil. And the first thing I said was, Okay, but I was scared. I was scared out of my wits because here's a here's a example on the on the one side where you can actually see lentils. That's where we've had timely weed control. On the other side, which just looked like a, a wild oat crop, is where there hasn't been. I didn't think it was going to be possible to grow lentils organically because uh, they're you know they're short, they're a wimpy little crop, they're easily overtopped, and you know even a conventional lentil field usually looks like a mess of weeds, right? You know, so how could you grow those organically? Well, the first thing I thought to do is, well, let's look at seeding rate. I've done some seeding rate experiments and can get some suppression. Maybe you can in lentils. I don't know. So we did that, and here's the results here. This is a crop and weed biomass. The line that's going up is the crop biomass. The red bar across there, that's the, that was the conventional recommended seeding rate of 130 plants per square meter, or about 12 plants per square foot. What we found is we increased the seeding rate, we also decreased the weed biomass. When you grew the recommended seeding rate, you were growing about half weeds and half lentils on a weight basis. But as you cranked up that seeding rate, not just a little bit, but a lot, you were able to suppress those, uh, suppress those, not to the point of making them weed free or anything, but certainly to a large degree. And when we took it all the way to yield, by, with increasing the seeding rate, we could get you easily over a thousand, over a thousand pounds an acre average in over four years. And you know, given that lent, organic lentils usually sell for about, well, right now they're about a buck a pound. That's like you know a thousand dollars gross an acre. And we figured it out with the seeding rates, and it paid to increase it and everything. So that that was good. And it got our plots so they looked reasonably clean. You know, they can still see there's weeds in there, and uh, and by harvest you can see there's it's still weedy, but it's was pretty darn good for not using any herbicides at all. Another thing we looked at was we decided to look at, well, how can, how can, those, uh, how can increasing your seeding rate, how, how can that have an effect on uh, herbicide efficacy? You know, part of the problem is, you know, and I'll introduce this uh, later, is that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of lentils rely a lot on group two herbicides, the immies, you know, uh, uh, Odyssey, and, uh, Odyssey and Solo for their, uh, for their applications. So, we did this with an experimental herbicide that we knew had a lot of problems. Uh, Fluthysat methyl, cadet, it's not a registered treatment, so I'm not saying you should use it, but we were looking at it as a way because we knew it wasn't a good herbicide. It has, uh, 
It has tolerance problems in the lentils. You can see the white plots here. In this experiment, we had different rates of the herbicide being sprayed on the lentils. And uh, you can definitely see there's crop tolerance issues. So we were trying to use as low a rate as possible uh, and still get good weed control. And we thought, well, maybe if we increase the seeding rate to get more competition, that may give us a better, that may give us a better, uh, give us more, uh, better herbicide efficacy. And so this, this, uh, this uh, graph here, I'll take a second to explain it. On the bottom axis, that's the increasing the rate of, the herbicide fluthicet methyl from zero, and it's all log scale, so it's kind of counting by powers of 10. So zero, one, 10, and the next one would be 100 if we went that far. That's how often you do that with herbicides because they tend to have their, their, they tend to, you need basically 10 times as much to get twice the effect when you're using a herbicide. On the left axis is the mustard biomass. We use tame mustard as a weed in here because uh, the farm manager didn't want us bringing group two uh, wild mustard onto the farm for some odd reason. Uh, <laughs> so we use tame, uh, any resistant uh, tame mustard uh, uh, as a kind of a fake weed. What we see as we look across there uh, is that the black line is the low, is half the recommended seeding rate. As we go to the recommended seeding rate in red and to the double the recommended and even higher is that we're we're decreasing that mustard biomass. Essentially, we're suppressing that, we're suppressing the weed by having more crops there. But interestingly enough, in our first year at both locations, we also reduced the amount of herbicide necessary to, re to, to, kill, uh, to uh, reduce that biomass by 50%. So we had kind of a double whammy. We, re we reduced the rate necessary to reduce it and as well the total biomass so we did as well the second year we had similar results but it just reduced the biomass but essentially in terms of what it looked like uh, we had that suppression effect by increasing our seeding rate so the top uh, the top left panel there's 70 is half the normal recommended and then double then the, then the recommended to the to the right of it can you guys see this if i go like this can you see that Okay, okay, uh, that's the recommended, and then going to double the recommended. We went to quadruple because we wanted to see how far we could push this, but we certainly don't recommend going that high. So we were getting pretty good suppression there, and if, when we added in uh, a rate of the herbicide that wasn't too hard on the, on the lentil, that there, was good, that there was pretty good tolerance, we could get some pretty effective weed control compared to the check there. And uh, we saw this also in the yield, as we went to the uh, at the recommend at the uh, at the uh, at double the recommended seeding rate, the interesting thing was is it the herbicide dose didn't really matter that much. We had a wide range of uh, herbicides of herbicide doses that would give us the maximum yield. However, at the recommended rate, it was very very specific. Only at that one dose did we kind of maximize it off. So it gave us kind of a buffer that, so if, the, you know, if it was an environmental year, the herbicide wouldn't work that well, how we interpreted it, that you could still get good thing, good uh, yield, con good, good yield. And the second year, the results were similar. Um, as you uh, went to a lower rate, you had lower control. So the end point of that one is that herbicide hasn't been pursued for registration because of those tolerance issues, but we are looking at, uh, but uh, the Pulse crew, Chris Willenberg's group, is at, in, in combination with Bert Vandenberg, are looking at trying to find uh, some lentil varieties that are more tolerant to it. But I think I use it as a, as a case study to show how increasing your crop's competition can help your herbicide, essentially. So how can, how can make, essentially, what's a really, basically, a, uh, yeah, I was going to ask, can I say the word crappy, and I just said it. Uh, how can you take a crappy herbicide, can you make it a good herbicide by using some good agronomics in there? And yes, you can. And that's where we're kind of at with uh, herbicide resistance. The products we're looking at aren't from the A list or the B list anymore. We're looking at the C list. We're looking at products that were rejected, in many cases, decades ago because they weren't that good to try to deal with this, in many cases. Uh, part of the reason we were able to get under the organic experiment, the, pre, the first experiment I talked about, 
part of the reason we were able to get the, the good results we did was we also used mechanical weed control in there. We used some in-crop heroin in order to control our weeds because that's a standard organic practice. It was a standard organic practice at the time. So we did that. That was something that we did as well. So this is something else we wanted to look at. And we also wanted to look at um, a practice called rotary hoeing. This is where uh, this is an old, another old implement that was popular in the in the Midwest of the U.S. in soybean production, and, and, and these are just passively driven wheels. They just turn as you go through the ground, and you drive your you drive your tractor really fast. If you want, if you're interested, there's a video. I have a video showing it online. You can Google and probably find it. Rotary hoeing, uh, uh, and that seemed to Eric Johnson found that that could work quite well. But it only controls weeds when they're quite small. Before in fact, it actually works best before the weeds are even emerged, so timing is very important. There's just a 60-foot version in a farm in Quebec. Uh, Eric Johnson, my colleague out of the University of Saskatchewan, now formerly a Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, did some work on and found that the pulses were quite tolerant to it at uh, multiple stages and at different, uh, and different number of passes. So it's very gentle on the crop. and. Uh, and also, he also established, what was nice about this, was that this could work in no-till land. Uh, that high residue was not an issue, as opposed to, if I can get back here, I'm trying to get back with the arrow, the harrow, whether well, these in-crop harrows, which, you know, if you're trying to go in any residue, will just plug solid, like a comb going through a sheepdog's hair or something like that. Was, we also found out that the, that, not, it's not that intuitive that the rotary hoe can actually work quite well, but we'll get into that in a second. Uh, finally, we also looked at with Catherine Stanley at intro cultivation to control weeds. And this is, uh, again, under organic conditions, but don't worry, I'm going to bring this back to conventional in a little while. So steer, using steerable cultivators that can cultivate between the rows. We did it on 12-inch rows. Some producers are going as narrow as 7-inch rows. And commercial versions of these have uh, cameras which, uh, you know, with, through machine vision, move the, move the cultivator back and forth to stay, between the, to stay between the rows. So they require the crop to be up to be able to get them. So the question when I always got is, is um, which one of these work best? But first, Catherine established that, that uh, we had to establish the safety of this machine. And so Catherine Stanley, who you can see there, is now at the University of Manitoba, with Lena Sarovi, who's uh, in the back of our cultivator. We just got a, I, I say it has a uh, uh, hydraulic uh, biomechanical actuator on that. So it's a person steering a wheel that controls a hydraulic cylinder. <laughs> That's how we guide ours. Uh, uh, so we did. So anyway, so first thing we did is establish that it doesn't hurt the the peas, to, peas or lentils too much, and we did establish that during the critical period of weed control, it, it had a small effect on the yield if it was later in it, but not much. And some of you may be asking, what's the critical period of weed control? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, <laughs> because the critical period of weed control, we determined with, uh, with uh, Leah Fedoric uh, quite a few years er before that, that the critical period of weed control is the time that you should remove weeds from a crop to avoid yield loss. And so the first part of this is, if you have weeds that emerge at the same time of the crop, is how big can you let those weeds get before you uh, have to kill them, before they start changing the yield potential of the crop. And we established that that was at about the five node stage in lentil, that if you remove them by then, you're okay. If you waited later, you can see by the seven node or the nine node that our yield potential is going down greatly. The other side of that is the is when do you have to worry about a second flush? And we established that a second flush of weeds that emerges after the 10 node stage does not damage the yield in lentils. So if you put those together, you have to control your lentils, and these are over the three years we did it, you have to control your weeds between the five and the 10 node stage in, uh, in lentils in order to prevent yield loss. And that worked out well because that you know, if you get on the early side of that, the, the inter-row cultivation isn't damaging them at all. We did find, however, that multiple, that multiple passes of that inter-row cultivator did affect the uh, yield potential of the crop, as we can see with two passes, uh, and then three passes uh, reducing the yield potential compared to, uh, compared to the check. So uh, 
So that's something we didn't, right, because of obvious damage, you're dragging between there, you're root pruning, there's track damage in there, etc. So anyways, we'll wrap that, that one up. Uh, the, the key point here we want to get with our next project is which one of these machines work best when I talk about this, and uh, is that I always get questions from producers, well, which, which one should I buy? And so we want to put them all head to head. The rotary hoe, which can, op which can operate very early at any excellent crop stage, is a rotary hoe, but only very early in the weeds, early pre-emergence to early cotyledon. The harrow, much uh, fair to good tolerance. It can be pretty hard on the crop because you're pulling these tines through that are dragging these, are, these tines are just rolling, so they're not really affecting the crop. These are dragging, so you can drag, pull the crop out, or cover it up in some stages. But you can use it, but it can kill later weeds. Or the intro tillage, which you have to wait till you can see the rows to do it, and can get better weeds. So we designed a project to look at this. We looked at pea and lentil. We've only done one year. I'll just show you the lentil results. We've been very, very pleased with the level of weed control we're getting. Uh, in, in, in the two sites we did, weed biomass and lentil, the one site which didn't have many weeds emerge, the rotary hoe, intro tillage thing, reduced the weed biomass by 51% to a fairly low level. That's, that's oops, that's uh, 250 pounds, that's essentially 250 pounds of weeds per acre. And here, going from the control to uh, some of our better treatments, we had about a nine, almost a 90% reduction in weed biomass in this site with quite heavy weed population. Uh, in terms of yield, we saw a yield boost in the one site with the less weeds of 15%. In the other site, we saw an 80% yield increase with our best treatments uh, doing this. You know, and this, this is not using any herbicide at all. In terms of visual impact, here's, you know, the before rotary hoeing, after rotary hoeing. You don't see much difference here because you're controlling the weeds when they're tiny, before you can almost really see them. In many cases, they haven't even emerged. They're just in the white thread stage. The harrowing, you can see some, it is damaging some of the plants in a row. And the intro tillage always looks very impressive, but if we go back and look at it, in some cases, it's not, um, it's, uh, where's the biomass? It's not doing that big a difference on weed biomass because it's essentially, in some cases, coming too late to do it on its own. But when you combine it with something else, it's doing a good job. So you can see visually we had quite good uh, weed control. It's actually, we were quite astounded. It worked way better than I thought, mostly because our grad student, uh, uh, Alex Alba, was perfect in the timing in this. We had good luck this year. We had, we had the one thing was some of these measures, if it's wet during the season, then you're, you can't do it. So that's, uh, that can become a problem. So, but we had pretty good uh, conditions and good timing. Uh, so conclusions that worked well, but it's only one year of data, so think. So now I want to bring it back to conventional, to conventional control. We know this, and I've given you some examples, some extreme examples. Here's if we don't use herbicides at all, what we can do. What can we do if we start combining cultural methods with herbicides? Is that going to give us, is that going to give us a better way to control herbicide-resistant weeds? Because we know that wild mustard, is certainly in Saskatchewan, has become a huge problem in lentils as well as kochia, and these are from field. This was not an unusual site, as you guys know. So we use the rotary hoe, we also increase the seeding rate, and we use chemical weed control of heat or Sencor, because Sencor is not a group two product, and it can work on lentils. We did uh, those, these, these, uh, these uh, practices individually or combined at three different seeding rates, and I'll show you the results here. Individually, the practices didn't do that good. The, the rotary hoe didn't work that good in the years that we did this because it was wet at the time that uh, we should have used it, and we were too late, to be perfectly honest. But if we look at just the, uh, this is the mustard biomass in terms of the control versus the high herbicide worked really well. Sencor does a great, and mixing some heat in with the Roundup and adding some, and using the full rate of Sencor controlled the mustard perfectly. The integrated system, though, with a half rate of Sencor also did a pretty good job, almost as good as well. In terms of yield, and here you can see the suppression there. Uh, in terms of lentil yield, the high herbicide one did well, where we combined herbicides, but the integrated one, when we increased the seeding rate, managed to match its yield compared. So 
we kind of proved that concept there that integrating those treatments can uh, work well. But truth be told, a full rate of Sencor and heat uh, also gave excellent control. But what about the kosha? The kosha problem as well. We don't have much data on that. We only have one site here, but what we did with that one was looked at edge, fall applied edge, and rotary hoeing uh, to, at, uh, to control it. And what we found that edge or uh, a spring rotary hoe gave equivalent control of it. So the rotary hoe gave the same control as using the edge herbicide. But interestingly enough, adding uh, the rotary hoe and the edge essentially eliminated all the kochia in this trial at all. It, it remained all spring emerged kochia of that. So that, it's only one site here, but we're pretty excited by that. Well, uh, the, one of the last things I'll talk to you about is harvest seed management. You've probably all, this is Alberta, so I'm assuming you've all heard about the Harrington Seed Destructor and harvest seed management and that stuff, so I'm not going to talk to you about that. <laughs> so, but anyways, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I will plug my own research and say that I did do research on chaff collection 20 years ago that uh, uh, I think helped form some of the basis for this research. But what we're, we're looking at is using an alternative form of herbicide application and something that you guys are, who are my age or older, will remember uh, being around uh, farm shows in the 70s and 80s is using a wick applicator on weeds. And you think, oh my God, those terrible things, those PVC pipes with uh, ropes hanging out and that would drip all over the place. Uh, well, we thought we'd try to use it in low crops like lentils or flax for herbicide resistant weeds. Well, it turns out the technology has kind of come along these a bit, and there's different models you can use that are better systems from like that, or ones with rollers, or ones like this Garford weed foil, which has a pressurized system that wets a uh, thing. And these are, these are used regularly in sugar beet production in, uh, in, uh, in the UK. And there's a, you can see the kind of the entire, this entire, uh, mechanism, this entire area here will stay wet with the herbicide and you drive over top, wiping the herbicide on the weeds. So we've done some work with this. We've been working on this for two years. We're using an old fashioned one right now. We just have a, like a, like a, a pipe with a, with a rope in it, but we're going out in lentil, looking at wild mustard, native populations of wild mustard with three herbicides, 2,4-D, dicamba, and, we, and for 2016 we used the low volatility one and glyphosate and looking to see if that can reduce the weed seed production in mustard. We're not expecting it to affect the yield of the lentil that much because those mustard have already overtopped the, the crop canopy and are looking nasty, but we're expecting to, to reduce seed production. And what we are seeing is in fact that is true. Compared to the control, we're getting lower seed production in our mustard. Here's uh, in, our, in the wild mustard, in this wild mustard grown in lentil. Here you can see untreated plots versus treated plots one month after application. So we're managing to kill it pretty well. The timing, we, we're still working out the timing. There's some, based on this year's data, which is, I think we did a better job because we knew how to use the wicks better. It seemed about two, uh, our second application timing after trying to get most, all the, most of the plants uh, up seemed to work the best. But what was really interesting was that the dicamba, when we used dicamba as the herbicide, it really whacked the lentils. Even though we never touched them, we were very careful, never touch it. You can see in the glyphosate one, it's not affecting the yield. And there was little, there's a little bit of drippage, but not much. But what we think was happening in the dicamba is we were getting, uh, we were getting uh, volatilization and, uh, and vapor movement of the herbicide into the lentils, which was hurting them. And interestingly enough, there you can see that's the dicamba ones. And you can see it in the seed quality where we used dicamba. Uh, it was affecting the seed quality a lot. We image all our plots aerially. Uh, we started to this year. And you could clearly see where we had done this trial last year that uh, a lot of the plots had less weeds this spring than, they, uh, than the ones where we hadn't done it, where we had good timing. So we went out and counted them. And yes, indeed, our we managed to reduce our wild mustard by a fair bit, our populations. And this actually surprised us because we we're in an area that has a heck of a lot of wild mustard seed banks. So I wasn't sure if we would see an effect the next year. So we we're very pleased. So this may be part of a long-term practice to do it, or it could be something that's used uh, as, as well for, uh, for uh, controlling perennial weeds in that. So uh, the, 
Yeah, so I kind of covered this already. The weed wiping with glyphosate or 2,4-D dicamba worked, but the dicamba is not good. And, uh, and we reduced that. So I'm gone, tried to go through this quickly because I know you guys want to get on the road and so I'm wrapping her up here. So uh, I think using agronomy as a weed control method can control weeds. You know, I showed you increasing the seeding rate. That's probably, I wrote a paper uh, called Sometimes You Need a Big Hammer and the idea that in terms of using agronomy, uh, some things work well and some things don't work well, but increasing your seeding rate almost always gives you an effect when weeds are present. If weeds aren't present, it doesn't always. You can suppress weed, weeds. It can reduce the reliance on herbicide efficacy. And to be perfectly honest, I'm a bit, you know, when you see, you know, canola seed is so darn expensive. There's that temptation just to seed as little as you can to get it. And we have really competitive canola hybrids, and that helps us along. But if we keep going down this trend, we could be in the trend like they are with soybeans in the U.S., where uh, growing glyphosate-resistant soybeans was just a breeding ground for glyphosate-resistant weeds uh, because of... Uh, you, know, you end up n having not as much competition in there, and you end up relying too much on that herbicide. And again, when you rely on it too much, you know, it's eventually you're going to select for resistance. You know, mechanical weed control can be surprisingly effective. Is there a place in conventional agriculture? I don't know. You know, I'm not a farmer anymore. So, um, you know, I, th I think most people would look at it as an act of desperation. Is it some place that we're going to go? You know, maybe I think the future will possibly bring more intelligent mechanical weeding devices that I would speculate in another 20 or 30 years may be commonplace. Uh, you know, and looking at this old fashioned stuff is, you know, is, uh, uh, will be viewed laughably. Uh, you know, and reducing weed seed production mechanically, well, I didn't get into that, but you know, we're doing work in clipping as well, or chemically can reduce weeds the next year. And I'll end with that, and uh, any of you, uh, there's some, there's, there might be a couple in here that have taken uh, a course with me, and uh, and I've always saying that good agronomy is good weed control. I've joked with my wife that I, that's what I want chiseled onto my headstone when I when I'm put in the ground. <laughs> so I'm assuming she'll outlive me. <laughs> but anyways, so anyways, my acknowledgments. There's lots of people that helped fund this research, and if we have time, I would gladly take some questions. Okay, let's give uh, Steve a round of applause. So like spraying between the rows or spraying like, so you mean like using ultra low drift nozzles to try to spray a non-selective? Or shields? No, I'm not, but I'm aware of the technology and I know Eric Johnson and I have talked, yeah, I'm loud enough. <laughs> Eric Johnson and I have talked about that, possibly uh, looking at it, but we're, no, we're not. Yeah, yeah. That certainly has some, and certainly, you know, I always think like, you know, herbicide application is, when you think about it, is a crazy thing, right? Because you think, how much area of the ground do your target weed occupy? You know, like I always, in my class, I say, you know, spraying herbicides just over everything like we're doing, trying to hit one tiny little thing is like trying to inoculate, trying to inoculate children by, you know, going up in an airplane and throwing hypodermic needles out and hoping it hits some kids, you know, down there. <laughs> you know, it's just... <laughs> You guys will remember that one, right? <laughs> oh, sorry about that. It's like happy bunnies on a hill. <laughs> well, you know, but it, but it is kind of, you know, it would be nice if we could find some technology. Like, it's not, you know, herbicides, if we could target just the weed, you think of what we could do. We could increase the rate uh, and uh, reduce the environmental impact, reduce the cost. It'd be great. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Factored in the, the, the new Trudeauism that we have with carbon credit effects of tilling up the land. Yeah, I, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't done any. I know, like, um, the the methods we're using are relatively, uh, are relatively, like the rotary hoe. I'm not sure how that would affect soil carbon. The intro tillage more so. It is a shallow one, but I have no. I have no idea how much is affecting soil carbon. I know we tried to do some work with intra-row tillage 
and soil nitrogen mineralization. Uh, the year we were doing it was impossibly mucky and, uh, and it, we just couldn't get good samples uh, because of it. So no, I don't know. I don't know how it affects soil organic carbon. And on your research farm, do you have any rocks? Because 20 years ago, I tried and, uh, one of those rotary arrows with rocks, and uh, I got rid of the machine really quick because of the breakage. Yeah, the rotary hole is, uh, it's, it's, it, it, if it's really, there, it's a bit different than the rotary harrow because they are independently controlled, so they can go over them, but they can also pick up rocks the right size and uh, hurl them very well. And I don't know if you noticed in that picture, there's a cage on there so that it, one, either doesn't smash out the window of your cab or kill the operator from having a, a rock, you know, David-like hit them in the back of the head, you know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that is an issue. Rocks are always an issue whenever you have, yeah. Okay, I guess that's it. Thanks a lot, Steve. Okay, thank you very much. Wow.